I'm on an email list for a guy who calls himself Rama. And yesterday I got an email from him and it was interesting because he was talking about the brain being a magnet. And he was talking about joy and how joy attracts more joy with the magnetism of it all. And he's sort of saying that being joyful creates this magnetic wave of joy which changes the atomic structure of the world. And I don't know if that's true or not, but it's interesting because consciousness works in some way. If I'm at a, at a higher level of consciousness, that's going to change the reality I experience. And that will slightly change the reality other people experience as well. If everyone was all of a sudden in a higher re level of consciousness, we would experience a different reality. And so it seems like there are different realities present. It's just a matter of our level of consciousness. And that's what we tap into. And I think with bipolar, we go into these high levels of consciousness and experience these other realities that are there, but they're just not the dominant reality. And that's why I feel like it's a calibration for us to see other maps and ways of, of getting there. And then he even talks about focusing on our hair in order to increase this magnetism. And he says, focusing on the top of your head increases your brain's magnetic power and it makes all of your thoughts more potent. And I like what he's saying. At the same time, I feel like if the mind is clear, if the brain is clear, then one doesn't have to think thoughts. There's perception and then that sort of gives understanding, which can be a joyful process in itself. So we don't actually have to consciously think joyful thoughts. It would be more about clearing the mind of all thought. But at the same time, thinking joyful thoughts is still a lot better than thinking sad thoughts, for sure. And he says you have to imprint and encode your version of reality into existence. And that's in alignment with the blueprint that I think that we're given in our brain when we go into manic consciousness, we get the blueprint of the reality of the higher levels of consciousness. And then it's up to us to, to harvest that and to move towards it. And we don't have to do that, but it's an option and it could be a fun game. It could be a fun way to use our supposed free will because in those highest levels of consciousness, we realize it's all one and we don't really have free will. And sometimes that can get us into trouble. So we come back here where we have apparent free will and then we can still harvest and practice and embody that which we know will unfold those higher levels of consciousness, not just within ourselves, but within other people as well. And I think that's the whole gesture thing. Because I had this insight today that one of the ways to have joy be one's predominant state is to help create that in other people. So I think the brain needs to be wired for these higher levels of consciousness. It already is wired for that. It's just a matter of actually negating the wiring that is not inspiring. And I feel like medication is, is chemical castration of this transformation process. It keeps those lower circuits glued together. And that could be helpful, just like Dr. Daniel Fisher said, these medications will buy you some time, but it's not going to stop the process indefinitely. And so I think it's important to get in alignment with the process.
And when I say that, I feel like part of the process is interacting in these ways with other people, not just with oneself, like I'm doing right now. Even though I'm not fully in those higher states, I'm sort of in this state of reason and logic and, and creating my own epilogic of things. I'm sort of having a dialogue with myself about the context, the map that I experienced before. I'm, I'm in the state of harvesting or maybe harnessing in that I'm creating the neural networks through dialogue about what it is that I experienced. And more accurately, it's what was experienced when I wasn't an I, when there was no ego. And I also realize it's not about focusing on mental health. We get stuck in focusing on the psychology and we don't really see that the whole psychology is the problem. And that a lot of the thoughts and psychology that we're having trouble with disappear at the higher levels of consciousness. So it would be more about how to be in the state of love and joy. I was thinking about natural alternatives and things like that and how over the years I've done a lot of research on natural alternatives for health and things and and I was thinking about how perhaps I need all of that because I don't have a natural alternative lifestyle. Modern lifestyle isn't really a natural one and I'm wondering if there's a way to have a lifestyle that is more in alignment so then maybe one doesn't need fake sunlight and one doesn't need so many of these natural alternatives that one can just get naturally. And I was once given a tip to lay with my feet up by someone when I had all those physical health problems and I'm thinking now that that tip was probably to get the blood going back to the brain. So I might try and do that more too. Now I feel like it's more about the brain than anything else. In the last two days, I haven't had any anxiety really. I have a little bit today because I'm probably gonna give my resignation today for my job. So I took two EMP instead of just one. And I feel like the statement, I don't know, is one of the most powerful statements because it opens up space in the brain. Even with everything I talk about with myself, I really have no idea what I'm talking about. And I forget everything, nearly everything. And I also was thinking about how joy oxygenates the brain. So I feel like the higher levels of consciousness are what actually oxygenate the brain or vice versa and it's it's something together that happens it's almost like as consciousness goes up more brains can potentially get oxygenated in that way and then they go up to joy but then a lot of them fall back down to the lower levels of consciousness and i feel like one of the reasons why that happens is so then we're calibrated in some of the lower levels of consciousness, we really see what we're doing to each other with our thoughts, feelings, and actions. And it's really scary. And I don't think it's meant to be something to get stuck in. It's meant for us to see what we're doing and the dangers of thought and thinking compared to being in those higher states of love. And people that have gone through that process they have the map within them and might be able to help people get up to that level of consciousness. Consciousness observes itself and how it responds to itself. And I feel it's intelligent to act to preserve the physical body, but it's not intelligent to act to preserve the psychology. And that's what we're doing when we're medicating people back to their ego structure. 
We're not helping people transcend that structure. And we're all living in abstraction and we derive pleasure from our abstractions because there's no joy in our actions. And our interactions with each other are more like inter-abstractions. And states of consciousness are what we all share. We have, we all have access to any state of consciousness. And that level of consciousness is what determines what is unfolding in that moment. So in that way, we're each the same. I read this article online, somebody writing about Carrie Fisher's dog and how she used it as a coping tool. And how she was brave because she carried the dog and then had to explain the dog, which means she had to explain her mental health condition. And I'm thinking she's brave and dead at 60. And it just angers me because then I was looking again at that article online about how people die 14 to 32 years early if they have a mental health condition. And it says they often die of heart attacks, strokes, and things like that. And they were saying, well, it's probably to the different conditions of their life because they often have lower socioeconomic status and things. Well, Carrie Fisher probably had all the best of life and she died at 60. And they say in that study, like, oh, we really don't know what causes it. Could it not be a side effect of medication? They don't ever say that it could be like that. Why do people get diabetes? Why do people... Diabetes usually happens to people pretty quickly once they're on medication. It's not something that happens 30 years later. It's like, well, how did that happen? So, I don't know, just kind of pissed me off. If she dies at 60, what luck do the rest of us have? I feel my question, what would a manic do, will help to grow the brain in the ways of the blueprint, because it sort of gets my mind going in the direction of the blueprint I was given. And that blueprint felt like heaven on earth. And I, I feel it will help to grow the brain cells back in that direction. And, and the next part of the process is being out in the relational mind with other people. Because me talking with myself is more developing my embodied mind. And Dr. Daniel Siegel talks about the embodied mind and the relational mind. And I think it'll help with the relational mind thing because I'm relating with myself and then when I relate with other people, it'll be more strengthened in my neurology. I feel like higher consciousness is a higher energy state. So it's almost like that energy has more electrons wherever it is and however it is. And that's also what contributes to more oxygenation of the brain to go into those higher states of consciousness. And it's about seeing clearly. In map consciousness, we can see really clearly so we can make new maps because we're not polluted by our old compass of thoughts. And so part of getting to higher levels of consciousness is just negating that which we think and believe to be true. And maybe just replacing it with, I have no idea. And back to the UC Berkeley TED talk, on neuroplasticity. He was talking about how deaf people can actually hear what they see in that the auditory cortex lights up when they're looking at somebody talking. So that part actually overlaps with the whole process of their communication as well. And I feel like when we become deaf to our prefrontal cortex noise, the visual cortex for us likely becomes the same as speech because normally we have the speech noise in our prefrontal cortex. So in terms of this sensory substitution or this neuroplasticity that might happen in map consciousness is that speech actually goes to the visual because the old droning on voice is quiet. So then what we see actually creates what we say and what we think. 
So I think there's a change in the brain processing in that way. And we speak what we see. And so psychosis, in a way, could be sensory substitution where the words are changing from the prefrontal cortex, abstracting to the visual cortex, and we say what we see. And that could be one of the reasons why some of the things that we say don't make any sense because we're actually seeing more of reality than the regular person can. We can see clearly, we're reading between the lines, we're learning how to read what we see in reality instead of our own abstractions getting in the way. And so this process takes some time to actually mature and develop. So after a while, we no longer think that when a crow flies overhead, that means that that God is angry or something like that. We can start to actually read reality and have this shift in perception, the way we perceive happen, I think medication helps prevent that switch from happening. So we then again are perceiving based on our own ego abstractions instead of perceiving from this other way of seeing. So I think psychosis is actually a switch in the way we see. And even Dr. Abram Hoffer said that mental illness is a perceptual problem. And he says that in his movie, Masks of Madness. And even saying that, I don't actually think it's a perceptual problem. I think it's a perceptual solution, but it's very troublesome to be able to perceive that clearly and read between the lines of reality in a reality that is traumatic and scary and based on competition and isolation and separateness and and all these things that aren't actually innately part of how we are as human beings. And this switch in perception gets us perceiving more so with how we are innately as human beings. To walk around in a reality that isn't designed that way is painful because we don't just see words, we actually see the feelings we see with our whole being, we're not just seeing with our eyes, we're seeing everything. I like watching talks right now on the brain and neuroplasticity because because the spectrum that I've experienced is what they're talking about even though they're talking about in, it in relation to something else. The brain is the brain. Consciousness is consciousness. I think what's actually happening is that consciousness gets stuck in thought and it actually identifies with thought as opposed to the level of consciousness that is, I don't know if it's creating the thought, but, or if the thought is creating the level of consciousness. So by negating thinking, level of consciousness goes up. And it's negating one's own personal thoughts and opinions and, and, and the value that one attributes to that. I feel like thought is the electricity, the negative charge going to the prefrontal cortex when it's supposed to be sort of flowing through us as consciousness comes through us, it gets funneled into thoughts in the prefrontal cortex so that all that energy gets wasted in the prefrontal cortex as opposed to just having it flow and then we're actually perceiving in the moment what's happening. Instead of perceiving our own abstractions about the past, I had an insight about the diabetes example that is often given about how people have to take their medications forever, just like diabetes. Well, actually, a lot of people manage their diabetes with just diet and lifestyle changes, and they don't take any medications. They have to have a very particular diet, very particular exercise and lifestyle, and they can manage it. Most people don't want to put the effort into that, so they have to take medication, which is fine. That's people's choice. And I feel it's the same with me, with bipolar. I can manage without medication. I haven't yet done that, but I feel I can. I might have to have a different lifestyle and diet and nutrition and things, and it might take a lot more effort but if that's something I want to do, I should be able to do it. 
what I'm saying is if a person wants to get to the point of not having to take any medication, it takes work and it takes really learning about oneself. Another reason why I don't really want to work in the mental health field is because I feel like a lot of the research I've done over the last couple of years regarding mental health is silly in a way because that's acknowledging psychology and thoughts which I feel are meant to be negated as Krishnamurti would say. So me being concerned about my mental state and my is actually just reaffirming the me which is the mental state which is the, the trouble in the first place is being over concerned with oneself and it's interesting how in mania one is completely fearless and not concerned with oneself at all really and then as the process ends and it's generally fearful one is again afraid for oneself one's fearful and not that that's bad it's necessary in the process of coming back because the me the ego itself is fear so it makes sense that we would feel that fear pretty intensely and that's interpreted as somebody's personal mental illness when really they were detached from the personal and more existing in the universal and then when one comes back down to the level of thought the level of society then one needs that ego process again and it's it's scary but that whole process doesn't mean it's a process to be feared or prevented from happening again I feel like if it's understood it's easier to to go through and that's why I'm talking to myself to create my own understanding to either prevent it from happening perhaps or if it does happen to be less fearful of it so mania is just consciousness freed from thought from personal ego thinking there's a different level of thinking which is from perception which is a creative process so it's almost like going from the ego which is destructive to this creative process and then we come back to this ego process which is destructive and one feels very loving and joyful and the other feels fearful and is giving the contrast to us like how do we want to live in fear or in this other state and we can create this other state by gesturing it into our brain into our nerve cells in order for that to maybe be more able to handle that level of consciousness filtering through our system and also it's almost like strength training to be able to maintain that level of consciousness to actually have it changed in us epigenetically and we can actually exercise that we can do gestures we can work out our nervous system and our our epigenetics and our our chemistry in order to be able to uphold that level of consciousness because right now we don't have that internal biology in order to withhold it and then we're medicated into trying to never experience that again and I don't think it's actually good to try to experience that state I think it's good to exercise the body in such a way that one can hold that consciousness in the body without actually feeling manic just it might even just feel normal and that's the thing once we get adapted it feels normal that state felt like this otherworldly spiritual amazing crazy magical thing because we haven't existed that way since childhood and then we can act in different ways so when that when we're actually in that level of consciousness we we've earned it we've practiced it in our body because we're so used to practicing our own ego and our own fear that that's why we stay in those states I actually feel it's important to practice this because there could be a huge wave of this energy coming this consciousness 
and a lot more of us could go into these states at the same time and all of a sudden the world could be on like this insanely crazy place and if we practice these higher states and these levels in our neurology then when that high energy comes we'll be able to maintain it and stay there and everyone else that falls into everything else will probably it will probably be hell on earth for a lot of people so this wave could actually be a clue of things to come and then everyone else is trying to stop the people who are going through this from happening when they should be actually learning how to start to practice these states in their own neurology so when that energy comes they're going to be able to handle it because the very people who are pathologizing us could be the next to be pathologized 